Okay, everybody. Uh, let's get started. It's already 11 at 5. Um, okay, so um, today uh, we're going to have our second seminar in this quarter. And the talk will be given by our own faculty, Anton uh, Versus. And Anton uh, is currently a research assistant professor at the CS department. And uh, after finishing his PhD in the University of Utah in 2013, and spent spending two years in Utah as well as a uh, research assistant professor. Uh, he is a hardcore, hardcore OS person, he has been doing a lot of work on building operating systems, and the day he will be talking about is recent work on uh, capability domains uh, towards building a secure operating system kernel. Okay? For those of you who have registered for CS200, the check-in words will be announced at the end of the talk. Okay? Welcome everyone, and I, I I hope that I'm loud enough, and uh, you don't need I don't need a microphone, but uh, if you if you have hard time hearing me, just tell me. So in general, yes, I build operating systems for many kind of years, and uh, my work ranges from something like uh, let's uh, build a new operating system in a new in a safe language, like rewrite everything, create clean slate to something more practical like uh, like this essentially. Let's take the Linux kernel and decompose it into isolated domains so you have certain security guarantees. And it, it, in general, the work kind of is rolling forward. It's towards the the embedded systems and, and data centers uh, which, which require much lower latency today. And uh, we start with the following introduction. So the, we think about the operating system as as, some, as something what runs on our personal computers. In reality, we run the same operating system, which is essentially equivalent to Linux, or <coughs> often it is Linux, on all of these uh, uh, embedded devices and data centers. So these, these are all pictures which are showing Linux as a, as a system. So it's something like a, a Google car, a, a medical device, or, like, uh, or, or your entertainment system on a plane. So they all run Linux. They are all essentially the same. And the systems were evolving for the last 40 years. And uh, of course, they grew in size quite a bit. And this is the map of the Linux kernel, which has uh, around 40 major subsystems and 20 million lines of code and uh, 3,000 device drivers. Well, they, they got complicated. And uh, the funny thing about them, that the technology which we use to develop the operating system has not changed since the early time-sharing machines. So it's still low-level C, bits of assembly, almost no testing or verification because verification tools do not scale that well. And uh, well, but the systems are moving forward with the 50,000 commits a year. And uh, at this rate, bugs are unavoidably introduced to the kernel. And this is the, uh, the timeline of the vulnerabilities found in a Linux kernel, which is reported, reported by the Common Vulnerability Database. In the 2016, up to date, it's uh, 151 vulnerability was found. Uh, and uh, what is a vulnerability? Uh, the, the, the takeaway from this graph and that the, it doesn't go down. So you might think that at some point, you know, systems are getting better, but in reality, well, it goes up and down like a wave, but it doesn't go down. But uh, what are those vulnerabilities? And uh, uh, there is a paper from uh, uh, MIT in, uh, published in uh, 2011, which essentially takes all the uh, vulnerability, vulnerability reports and classifies them, which kind of like a, a good first step in your research. And well, there, there are some of them are really simple, like something like, uh, like buffer overflow, or like uh, referencing a variable which was already deallocated. Uh, but also, at the same time, there are like uh, a, a class of vulnerabilities which is, uh, which is called semantics, semantic vulnerabilities. So essentially, you know, you, you forgot to check like a permission on your file just because you were implementing a new file system and you didn't know that this is what you were supposed to do. And uh, like, let me give you an example. Uh, this is a really simple one. You, you, you define two variables here. And one is a pointer, and another is a data structure. And well, accidentally, you this, is, this line was uh, in the Linux kernel for at least uh, three years. 
And another interesting uh, uh, fact about it, it's, it's part of the Linux firewall. So essentially <coughs> you can craft a packet, send it to a remote machine and exploit it. And the firewall is actually like, wow, you trust it to like, kind of like forward facing the insecure world and like bang, you got exploited. And uh, it was found or reported of the like, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny one line fix of course. <coughs> Uh, but in general, like what happens when the machine gets exploited? And I, I, like probably some of you do security research and you understand it quite well, maybe even better than me. But uh, the, the anatomy is the following. So if you find uh, like the vulnerability, like the one I showed you, you try to hijack the control flow. And the moment you hijack the control flow, essentially you start executing your own code in a kernel. Uh, you have a couple of goals, and your first goal is to gain persistence. So essentially, after after the <coughs> reboot, you want to be like uh, you want to like restart again on the same system. And typically, it's on a disk, but it can be much more esoteric. So you can you can try to attack or rewrite the firmware of your device driver, like something like a network card or even a GPU processor. And I mean, those those are found in the wild. And uh, then it's kind of like gets really interesting how you find them. Uh, but then, and then you introduce this uh, layer of uh, virtualization inside the kernel itself, which is called a rootkit. So essentially, it kind of fakes that nothing has changed. And if you run an intrusion detection tool, it's kind of it will try to reply that okay, like everything is normal. And then uh, it's it's an art of detecting and writing this uh, these layers. But it's it's quite advanced today. Well, the takeaway from this. Uh, introduction that it, in a more in a modern kernel a talker is of, is often one vulner vulnerability away from gaining control over the entire system and then typically over like the entire uh, organization if, if you want and it's not going to change in a foreseeable future because again vulnerabilities are there and like people are coming up with defenses but uh, they get broken quite 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 efficiently <coughs> as well so the question is, okay, as a systems researcher, can we, like, can we do a step forward and can try to make our systems more secure? And uh, this essentially, this is the essence of this work. Let's come up with a new organization of a kernel and, and, and see what will happen. And the, the short answer is isolation. We want to run a system as a set of like isolated domains. Then, I mean, how does it help? It helps in the way that if you find a bug in your network firewall, it's much harder to like to, to gain your goals, like be persistent, install a, like a, a rootkit and stuff like that. So it's possible, you, but you have to chain multiple vulnerabilities in all these components together. And it's still like people do that still. But it's to give to give you an example, isolation is kind of effective, and uh, you might not uh, like pay attention, but really isolation became a de facto technique in a, in your web browser. So the Chromium. Uh, web browser runs each each tab it, it, as, a, as a separate process because if your rendering en engine gets broken, you know, well, you're contained. So you can't jump from a tab which shows your favorite whatever entertainment site into the tab which shows your credit card account. Uh, and uh, well, actually, even inside the pages, the the funny part that there, there are sandboxes in JavaScript which run inside the page as well. <coughs> like for example, when you open a, a Facebook page, there will be a, a language layer JavaScript sandbox which can allow you to compose multiple mashups from untrusted parties on your front page, Facebook page. Again, the same kind of idea. And, and again, to give you an, a, a, an example of how, 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 how much it helps, uh, there is this contest which is called Pound to Own, which is, um, I think, funded by major industry partners, but let's say Google at this point, which essentially like, gives you a bounty if you break into a web browser, or, like fully patched. And a couple of years ago, one of those uh, break-ins, and usually they happen, and they, they, they might be different, but a couple of years ago, a person demonstrated a vulnerability or an attack which was chaining nine step and six vulnerabilities together so to essentially escape this layers of isolation which uh, Google, Google, uh, Google implemented in the web browser. So isolation is kind of, kind of helping. And, and, and there were other reasons, not just like blind isolation, but other reasons uh, which, I, uh, which, which essentially allow your ecosystem to scale better. So your verification tools will, 
will support the tiny mm. components. And if you have, if you're smart enough, you can specify the protocols between the file system, between the subsystems in your kernel, and then also you can like reason about what it, what is supposed to happen, or even like sometimes statically prove that your parts of the system are are implementing those protocols. And like for example, if you unplug a USB device drive, USB device, you know your your USB. Uh, device driver stack, which is notoriously hard because there are many abstractions, and like suddenly there is unplug, plug in, and power down, and stuff like that. It just doesn't explode. So, anyway, so the question is like, can we build it? Isolation is kind of hard because the motor, the kernel, <coughs> as, as we know them, they, they, they were not built for isolation, they were built for shared memory. And uh, well, they use like threads and normal function invocations to, to, to implement their logic. And if you want to to break it apart, it's, you have to think a little bit hard. And uh, there was a couple of attempts in the microkernel community which, which, which tried exactly that. And they kind of, I mean, we can say failed, but sometimes they ran out of resources and sometimes ran out of uh, kind of the tools were not, not there yet, or hardware was not yet, what was not there yet to, to support it at, at, a, at, a, at a proper performance, I guess. So anyway, our goal is this decomposed kernel. So we want to have a strongly, strongly isolated environment, and we want to control which subsystem can, can access what, because if you just decompose, you know, like nothing prevents you from jumping from one to another. You just have to invoke functions. But we will control who can invoke what functions. And ideally, we would like to reuse and modify the code, because there are like these four decades of evolution to like, which went towards <coughs> building your file systems and stuff. And you, should, you, you don't want to lose it. So you, you, you can give, it, give up some of it, but you don't want to lose it all at once right away. And of course, we want to be fast. And of course, yes, OK, back to my picture, like this, we want to run it. Kernel like that, file systems, these drivers, and stuff like that runs all run in, in, in isolated domains. Uh, and of course, there is some layer, which we will call a microkernel, but you can think of it differently, like a hypervisor or something, <coughs> which which, which allows them to like to coexist on the same hardware, implements isolation, implements communication primitives between them. But also, since we don't want to give up the rest of the kernel, well, we want it to run somewhere next to it. And so our, our microkernel will, will be embedded in the, in the original operating system kernel. And so, and, and, and the, the, all these components will, we, we shoot for, uh, to, 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 to to, to keep them unmodified and so but for them to work we have to kind of fake this shared memory environment and so we have these layers of glue code which we have to develop to fake to fake shared memory or kind of shared object space on top of in, in, in a truly distributed system <coughs> and of course but we want don't want to do like to do that by hand so we want to have some some high level language which we call an interface definition language which will essentially compile this code for us and and then everything runs. Okay, so maybe it's a good time to 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 ask if you guys have questions at this point. Since yeah, I, think I understand the basic idea, high level idea, but how would you provide those guarantees? Guarantees of what? Guarantees, for example, uh, are you expecting any kind of security properties? Like you want to provide guarantee for security, for example. Right. So the the guarantees. Uh, I mean, essentially, it, the first step is is just ensure isolation. What it means is that you inside your container you can do whatever you want. So if you find an exploit, we assume that you can hijack the control flow and start executing anything you want. The the main guarantee of isolation is that, or like we can say, it's a fault isolation that you can't easily propagate. Uh, uh, into other domains. So you can always invoke the functions like APIs of the interface of other domains, right. but often it's harder to find an exploit because you have to chain multiple <laughs> vulnerabilities together. Uh, but uh, yes, you can do a denial of service attack and you can steal like uh, all the data, confidential data, which, which, which is in that domain. So if you so want to separate multiple users, you will have to create multiple domains, so like multiple <laughs> file systems. And is that fair? Is that fair to say that the compiler, this compiler, will generate code that provides certain kind of guarantees that <coughs> that would make it difficult for uh, different domains to communicate with each other directly? Right. So no, no we have this additional piece, which uh, which we call then a, a object capability model. So essentially, 
uh, object capabilities are like references in languages. So if you have a reference, you can talk to you can talk to to a specific uh, uh, object which you hold reference to. Uh, but uh, really, you can't. Your authority is is limited by the by those the, the space which is covered by your references and their their transitive closure. And so this way, if we start one subsystem like a network interface driver, it might not have any references outside outside like hardware pages which allow it to to access the the device registers and and, and maybe and 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 a subsystem to which it relays packets. So like typically a TCP scan. But uh, the compiler code only executes the code. The, com the, the idea of compiler only ex uh, generates the code which, which helps us to run essentially. But we don't, we don't put any additional isolation guarantees there. What we plan on doing is uh, to have a higher level protocol specification in like the next version of this ideal, and then we can say, oh, by the way, the file system implements a notion of, for example, a session. So essentially, you can't open a type. Oh, you, you can't open a file, uh, you can't read a file uh, unless you open it and stuff. So it's essentially, it's a state machine which describes a protocol between multiple components. It's, the idea is called session types. And uh, it's, it's fun because then you can reason at runtime or sometimes at compile time if your language is powerful enough that you actually implement that protocol. And also, another beauty of it is as long as you fix the interfaces, and we do fix the interfaces even now, you can, you're free to do whatever you want inside. So, which means that, well, if you want to implement a fully verified file system, go for it. So today you do that typically by either using a fuse layer and implementing a user level file system there in Haskell or something. It depends on your like how advanced you are. But well, you can run it in something like choose your own language, or like like Rust or or even your domain specific language, which which has certain properties and like allows you to prove properties about the file system. And as long as you implement the interface, we'll be okay. And um, that's, uh, that's kind of, again, the, the additional property which, which isolation gives you. Of course, you know, you can say, well, do I really need it if I want to implement a file system, verified, fully verified file system, do I need to break it apart? Good question. Maybe not, but uh, isolated object spaces help. I kind of missed the point of the microkernel. The microkernel. Yeah. Because everything is isolated. Well, you can launch stuff and uh, everything will be fine. The problem is like, to, to, to do something useful, you need to communicate. And so microkernels implement two features. They essentially implement isolation and, and, and a narrow interface for communication. So there will be an IPC mechanism which allows you to call from one domain into another. And isolation means, means that the, the microkernel will create an address space and it will run you inside. And we actually use uh, hardware uh, virtualization to isolate uh, these components, so VTX and uh, VTD. Why? Just because it's easier to program. It's actually slower than normal, like whatever, address spaces and rings in, in, on X and <coughs> 6 but uh, it's much easier to program. And also it allows you to access devices. You can like remap. Uh, uh, real device registers and implement device drivers inside and they like like it's a it's a zero copy of native access to devices uh, does it help or in this architecture if an attacker attack to a subsystem it can exploit this subsystem and all of the subsystem that this subsystem can communicate with them Right, it can at least try. And there is another, another surface for attack is the microkernel itself. You can attack the microkernel in the same way how from a virtual machine you try to attack the hypervisor. So from a virtual machine you try to attack the hypervisor and the device drivers, para-virtual device drivers, which typically run in another virtual machine or inside the hypervisor. So yes. If the system uh, uh, is coupled and uh, we have a micro system that uh, communicate with uh, most of all, uh, all other uh, subsystems, the idea is not good in that system. So right. An but it can attack to that subsystem and exploit all of it. Right. Systems. But in reality, there, are, th there is just a couple of those subsystems which are tightly coupled. And the, the reason why people choose shared kernel is not because the sharing is required. Majority of your computations don't care about the rest. So you know, even you as a user, you access only your own file system tree. 
once in a lifetime you send a file to someone else and at this point set on communication between you between you and another user happens and so if you think about it only only a certain flavor flavor of communications chain computation chain domains which depend on each other but uh, and, and so and we will I mean I don't talk about it that much but it, it usually helps this isolation helps there is not that much shared shared uh, uh, Sure attack, but like for example, again in in, in a classical virtual machines, you know, uh, like uh, AWS, it was it, it is running Xan, and you run device drivers, or used to run device per virtual device drivers in domain zero, and whoever attacks a device in domain zero, wow, it runs the world and sells the exploit for for money, for good money, uh, and then they started like splitting the device drivers in different VMs, so that like you know if you exploit a uh, network device driver, you can't access to disk and stuff like that. So it's it's a lot of fun actually, but uh, but hard. Okay, more questions. Okay, the last one. Let's Should the software drivers be go through basically the micro kernel or the actual kernel, and the actual kernel goes to the micro kernel? Before yeah, the actual kernel will go to the micro kernel in an ultimate case, and actually it will be better for performance as well. That's that's kind of like a flipping like the other side of this coin is that that when you give up the classical. Uh, OS architecture, you will actually gain performance, and that's so like so counterintuitive. But the the, the 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 intuition behind it is that the kernels which we which we run now, like essentially Unix machines, were created for time sharing. They, there was a one piece of hardware <coughs> which was time shared between like hundreds of users, and it's. The software is overly general to so implement like all the interfaces and does a lot of multiplexing. But in reality, today you have a data center floor and you run memcached on it and like nothing else. And if, you know you might think hard and say, okay, I don't need a file system there or my network stack. Well, it's only UDP. I don't need TCP. And then and, and and you couple it along with the device driver, which talks to the network. And that's essentially the idea which InfiniBand was doing forever, but now. Now Intel DPDK does it for it. Uh, Intel DPDK is a data plane development kit. It's a it's essentially a kernel bypass, a device driver architecture for for the Linux kernel. So essentially, it's a device driver which runs in a user level application. You implement all your like all your network stack in there in a user level. Kernel doesn't touch at all. Like it just like sets it up the data plane and then it's like straight down and it's much faster. It's like several orders of magnitude faster than than going through the real kernel. And that's why it's another. It's, you might never think of it like, but it's, uh, this decomposition helps with performance. Not always, you can find a workload which gets slower, like a desktop probably, because now you have to cross multiple domains, but, but in a data center, uh, it, it works. Okay, let's move on. So, like a short outline what will happen. So yes, that's essentially what, it, what is going on. We want to build this kind of like a distributed system because like, you don't have shared memory anymore. It's not distributed in a way that you know, so your components suddenly disappear because they, they, they fail or network, network links fail, but it's distributed in a way that you need to, to have uh, these joint object spaces somehow communicate over that isolated environment. And so there are three components which you, want to, which you, which you have to think about. It. And everything is in, is in a native language. Native means it's C. Linux kernel is built in C, so you, you want to kind of build your tool chain towards the goal of supporting uh, C, because you know if you have a different language, you might come up with different ideas for how you fake uh, objects which are really live on another machine. And like Google uses Go and stuff like that. Uh, so we come up with these patterns of decomposition. Essentially, uh, what are you going to do with a low-level C code so you can kind of continue using it, but the objects live elsewhere? And then, of course, you want language support automated because the code is complicated, so you want to reason about it, what's going on when you split it apart. And then you care a lot about the performance because now you have to do these domain crossings, uh, which, is, which, which on a modern hardware take, takes time. Okay, first is the, the ideas of how you decompose. So this is, this is your normal kernel, like Linux, which you run in your laptops if you run Linux. So Mac runs BSD, which is essentially the same. So like, uh, it's kind of a layer design, but everything live, lives in a shared object space. So essentially, if you have objects, you can freely pass pointers from one subsystem to another. So you start, like for example, doing the write inode. Well, I write, to write a file, essentially. Well, you drop into like a file system from the virtual file system. You pass the pointer, everything works. And now it's, 
uh, go to the block layer and everything works. But in, in our architecture, it doesn't work because now they, these are three three different components, <coughs> and you choose how you want how fine grain you want to go. It depends on your goals. But uh, let's assume in this example we, we chose to split in three layers in three different components. And now now each of those has have their own objects, like because. We can't share object because if I modify an object, it means, well, you suddenly fail because if I, like, I put a null pointer there somewhere, you fail. So we have to, to maintain some consistent view of what we think the system, the, the system status, but we don't really, we can't share it for security reasons. And uh, what, what happens if I invoke a function from the, from the virtual file system, which in this example runs inside a uh, non-decomposed Linux kernel, like it stayed inside the kernel. And it jumps, essentially does an, a, an IPC, interprocessor communication. So essentially it's an invocation through a microkernel or through a, a different mechanism, which I will describe later, and drop, jumps into another domain. You have to like somehow say, well, this is, this is actually the object which you should like use. This is what I mean. And I mean, normally we do that only in distributed systems. Like, you know, you use key value store to assemble like um, the, the distributed system infrastructure. But here we were in a kernel. But the ideas are kind of the same. So, and just to have, give you a flavor of what, what needs to be done, and this is, this is the example of what a typical kernel interface is. So you, you normally have like, well, normal functions, so like register a file system. It's a function which is exported by the, by the virtual file system to all the file systems. And if you implement your own, you just call it and like, it, the kernel understands, okay, the new file system is there. Well, kernel is, uh, although it's written in C, often implements these interfaces because you know multiple file system might have different uh, different implementations of those functions and which means that you know well you have to register your own implementation this is called an interface so essentially what you're passing here are function pointers which are private to your specific implementation and, and finally you have normal data structures like which you pass pass along they are they're not super complicated I mean they're complicated but they are not like trees so passing a tree across subsystem boundary doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense in a distributed system either because you know it's a, just the wrong choice of interface. And so your, your first goal here is to start supporting like this primitive. So you want to support exported functions. You want to support passing and synchronizing data structure. And you want to support uh, stuff like you know <coughs> function pointers because then your unmodified code continues to run. I mean. I mean, maybe you need a minor change, but it, it's just essentially convenience. And you might you might think of it that what if I want to start clean slate, essentially re-implement everything from scratch? What kind of a model will I choose to essentially synchronize objects between subsystems? And maybe this is a reasonable choice. Maybe not. So it's arguable, but it's not the worst choice. So you like uh, you do that, and you kind of have a global view of the world. And so here is an example. So you have a original code, you have a function foo, two parameters. Our interface language says, well, we wrap it in an interface. An interface, by the way, takes a channel, which means that it knows where to send messages if anything like if anything happens. And then you say, well, I would oh sorry, I would declare a function, RPC, remote procedure core, which is foo. And from this specification, the ideal compiler generates the code, which essentially you can use from your unmodified code. So essentially here what happens, the, we generate the function foo with the same signature, so your code remains source level compatible. But inside it calls a function which, which uses a channel because it has to go over to another domain. So we have to hide this channel somewhere and I will show you how we hide it. But uh, the, 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 the main logic of the invocation is that we will say, we will create a special message saying that, well, we like it's a function type foo, and then there is a couple of parameters which we want to send to the other side. And this is called marshalling. You do the same in the distributed system when you cross one from one, one machine to another. So essentially, you put these <coughs> parameters and messages, and it can be a network packet, and send it over with this IPC set mechanism. On the other hand, someone will receive this message on the other side and, and do something meaningful. Well, kind of, well, this is the channel. Kind of works. So, okay, I had a bunch of transitions which describe the, the picture. So this is the functions. Now, what about the what about the data structures? Again, like the kernel has data structures, and uh, the kernel actually m mixes kind of the public and private fields of those data structures. So, for example, some of those fields, like you know, 
user ID, you can't export to another subsystem because if it gets changed, you like it's a privilege escalation. Another example, you know, a private if you're in a link on a linked list, linked list. Well, you know, like if someone changes this pointer to a null, you immediately crash. So you can't export those pointers. So you have to kind of split it apart and explicitly say which fields you're willing to exchange with another subsystem. Then, well, you do that, and you we, we have this idea of a projection from like in mathematics, if you have an object and you project it on a certain like plane, you have only partial view of the object. And so here we list explicitly what you which fields we want to project. And here we say we will send this I mode field inside, we send the other fields inside, but we also expect to receive them back, to receive updated values. And you have to like you have to split the your system in this in terms of those interfaces, which kind of helps, as I said, to, uh, towards m moving a cleaner implementation, uh, but it's, it's, it's a non-trivial undertaking, especially for the kernel. For a system, for a simple subsystem, easy. For a hard, like key value stores, or like two functions, put and get. Uh, well, for, for a kernel, it gets involved. Now, how we support remote references? So let's assume I send you an object once, and I want to refer to it later. So you have to like, you need an idea that, okay, this is the object. It means something in another subsystem, kind of like a reference. So we use this trick that all the data structures are wrapped in a container. And now it's, again, it's it just to hide the, the, the additional information, like channels and remote references from unmodified code. By the fact of wrapping, you can always do this trick, container ops, essentially move from a regional inode data structure to, the, to, to, to its container, and inside container find, a, find additional fields. And so in, in this example, the field is uh, uh, this remote reference, which points into some, like, we call it a C space, capability space, which, which essentially enumerates all the objects available to you and finds the, the inode on the other side. And then that I node is passed to the function on the other side. And that's, that function will operate on this data structure, will not crash because it exists there, and we control the lifetime of these objects. And so you roll forward. Uh, last interesting bit is, is, is function pointers. Like in those interfaces, uh, it's, it's a common paradigm that you export a function pointer. But now, like, imagine you want to invoke function across the network. And in this case, it's across, across subsystems. So this is, a, this is an example where this, uh, you pass a data structure which has a bunch of function pointers, a new file, a RAM file. And it's, it's a real function. It's just a function. But in C, you can create a function pointer. And what you do, you, you want to, like, you want to pass the data structures in another domain, in this virtual file system domain, and you want them to be meaningful. So you want to be able to like the rest of your code to work. So if you if you invoke a function pointer, it will like point to somewhere meaningful. But that meaningful part actually needs to go back across the subsystem. So it's essentially for each function pointer now we generate it dynamically like in a heap area, for example, it's wrapped in a container, and there is specific like trampoline sequence which you, you jump on a function, but then it understands that I'm, I'm uh, I, like above me is a container, so I can read some additional information from that container. And it, like, what, what, what is this information? It's like a channel, because if you want to send messages somewhere, but the original function signature doesn't does, didn't know anything about messages, so you you hide them inside the containers and send them over over the, the channel, like which which again back. Or M, and you, you hide remote, remote references as well. Well, that's kind of like how you deal with kind of the patterns of code which you want to decompose. The next thing is that, okay, you now you split apart everything, but you know, there are some, there are some utility functions which, uh, which uh, you know, your, your normal code expects to see, like a, a malloc. So K malloc is a memory allocator in a Linux kernel. Or like copy string, string CMP. Well, you want to suck this function in because th those are your private implementations. But essentially, you you have a library which I implements a kernel personality, so the rest of the code can use it. And this library we call it libkernel. Okay, and uh, so it implements this uh, mem mem copy print k common functions like spin logs, read copy update primitive synchronization, and then uh, and okay we're again we're not new here. So there is a domain of which of people who build these library kernels for performance reasons to run them in the data center. So essentially, when you start your Apache server, it will run against okay Apache server maybe okay to a certain degree a bad example, but uh, 
uh, it talks like to this private minimal kernel implementation, not the entire Linux. And so your virtual machines are much smaller. And uh, a tiny, a tiny node and information flow. Like, what does it mean? So, what ideally we want to achieve in the end is that, well, I let's assume this function foo is some sensitive function, so it does some encryption, and I want to invoke it and know that you know if you break it, you can't really escape, or it's a complicated function which we don't really trust the implementation, so like you know spaghetti code. And so, what we what we can do with this ideal is we essentially can pass two pages, one for input arguments, one for output. The Everything will get mapped underneath. Uh, so for you, it's kind of transparent. And then you, you go execute this function. And the only, the only like, the, the, the function, if it gets exploited, it can only attack the microkernel or can attack the rest of the code by somehow, by somehow constructing values in this out field, which can crush the rest of your code. But it's kind of, it's, it's harder than, you know, and jump from one one function to another, and and, and, and directly walk it in, in a kernel. And well, and this this layer lives in the microkernel, so essentially, uh, I don't want to overload you, so let's skip it. Language supports essentially, as I said, uh, you want to be able to describe the interfaces between the components, and you have to you need to come up with a decently powerful language to to do that. So, and so of course we did. So this is the language which uh, describes like all the interactions and helps you to generate the, generate the code. So here's, here's an example. So again, so you have this uh, remote function invocation. So this is the, the line which has RPC. It's, we want to preserve like original signatures of functions. So, and that's, what, that's why we write them in such a manner that they actually register a test, takes the file system pointer. We, however, have to take a projection because what are, we know to we have to understand which fields of this original data structure we have to send over, and so we did, we we, de we declare a projection here. Like the projection, it's inherited from this struct file system, and then the compiler can go in and see, okay, I'll have to send the ID field in. I will send in the size and I expect to receive the size back. And even more fun inside those projections, you can have enough uh, like more projections. And here, these file system operations are those function pointers, which I don't show the, de the, the definition on the slide, but they essentially are function pointers which, which register the interface of a file system with this function call. And here, we also have this syntax. And I went kind of faster because, OK, I have all these okay, uh, highlights. But what, what I wanted to say is that here, we generate the syntax for we have a syntax for saying, OK, and by the way, create a new channel. Essentially, well, sometimes you start on one channel, and sometimes it's slower than you want. And sometimes you say, OK, I need another channel. And these channels can be asynchronous, so you don't have to exit in the microkernel. And I will talk about it like uh, in, 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 in two seconds, essentially. But uh, this way, you kind of like, you can start from completely isolated state, bootstrap more channels, start, com start communicating. Everything is running. Everyone is happy. The problem, however, is like, wow, kernel interfaces are hard. And this is like just whatever, seven lines of the super block data structure. And in reality, it's probably hundreds of lines. And they have other, other data structures which are pointed by pointers. So it's kind of hard to, or the kernels are kind of modular, it's still really hard to see like which fields of those data structures are touched where. So of course, and this is partially why the, the effort failed before, because the two chains which would give you the answer automatically what were not available 10 years ago, even 15 years ago. So remember last week you were here, so there was Wonimer, Rakamarik, the speaker. So we are collaborators and we work on this tool. It's essentially it's part of LLVM compiler. And now you have you can run LLVM on the entire Linux kernel. It will not boot, but it will compile. And LLVM has this step which is called data structure analysis. Essentially, you can say, well, this is the data structure, and this is the function. So can you tell me which fields of this data structure the function touches, writes and reads? And so you can run the static analysis. And importantly, you can, oh, well, it's kind of trivial, you see. The, the hard part is alias analysis. <laughs> Essentially, when you start reasoning about, well, it's a pointer. It points somewhere, but really, is it point to the same data structure or not? Then it gets hard. But 
more or less it kind of works and you can you can run this tool and understand <coughs> it's it's not super new but it's kind of it's new at scale at scale of the kernel and okay. then you can generate this IDO <coughs> definitions uh, definitions automatically and then that's a big win Hurry. so so can you so I know this analysis is a, essentially a point analysis right right and then number one this analysis is buggy right you know, right. You know this right yeah. Yeah. number two um, if you were to run this on the whole Linux kernel, I guess there are a lot of different modules. Then can you actually get the call graph? I guess this essentially relies on the whole program call graph, right? right. Which function calls which yeah, other functions. Yeah, right, yeah. But you cannot get the whole program call graph for, for Linux if you don't. If you use the whole game, that's my understanding. No, you can't. You, you can get it only like uh, per module call graph. Can you get, yeah. get the whole? Yeah, you can oh, compile okay. the entire kernel yeah, yeah, get yeah. the giant BC file, and BC is what uh, right. binary uh -huh, something, yeah, yeah. what Zwanning were describing, and then LLVM kind of does all these bosses. And I only vaguely understand, but it's like general compilation stuff, so optimizations, yada yada, yeah, reachability yeah. analysis, and DSA is part of them. Okay. It works. So different modules can be linked? Yeah. Okay. No, of course, like modules are separate, so right, you right. have to build them in. But That's then. Uh, no, it, it took us some time. So there is this bright person here, uh, Vikram. He was like uh, <coughs> working on it for a couple of days, but it was involved because unless you're a kernel hacker, but someone from a from a programming language community, it like takes you weeks or maybe months, and often people just fail. But you have to, you can, you can roll it. So it's called. Uh, there is a tool which kind of puts all the junk which LLVM generates for individual <laughs> files on a file system, but records in the object file, it records the path to that file. And then when you use as, a, as, an, as an elf section in a file, and when the linker runs, it just combines the elf sections together. So okay. in the end, you get a binary, single binary, but it has these links to the files. And then LLVM is happy because there is another tool which probably merges them together. And then you, yeah, like you go for it. But I think in our experiments, it takes, uh, okay, we, we, we use Smack, so it's a kind of like a not a parallel, not a parallel compiler or whatever, static or whatever, verifier. It takes, I think, something like 40 hours or 24 hours to come back to do this pass. No, not com compilation is fast, regular right. speed, but DSA. You should use our analysis. Yeah, this, this is what I ask once. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, let's do a paper about it, and yours will be probably faster, no, and maybe less buggy because LLVM is. Orders of magnitude faster. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but uh, it's kind of funny because why? Like, just uh, it's like, but those tools they can change the game with like the whole kernel analysis is fun. <coughs> but yeah, kind of there, not not quite, but. Yeah. Okay, now performance. Wow, you know, I, I was talking about this crossing these domains, but how much time it takes. I mean, it's kind of interesting to reason in terms of cycles about many things which you usually do on a CPU. And like, majority of people don't really like think in these terms. But with, when you like get hired for like by uh, top companies, you know, you, you often start reasoning. So it's kind of funny that uh, this is the cost of an IPC on a modern hardware. To cross from one domain into another, it takes you 600 cycles. That's a lot. Because there are implementations of uh, distributed systems, let's say key value stores, which receive a network packet, do a key value lookup <coughs> in memory, and reply it with the budget of 560 cycles. And like if you start thinking about it, 560 cycles is the kind of the max. It, it's like 500 instruction, you like you might, uh, you were probably you heard from your architecture teacher that you know you have like more instructions per cycle, but in reality some cycles, uh, some instructions take longer than one cycle. Like accesses memory accesses hit <coughs> first level cast list like two or three cycles, right? And so it's totally non-trivial to do anything in five five cycles. Receiving network packets. Good luck to you. And I mean, like, if you can do that, let's publish a paper. But people can do that if you really care. So this number is high for the, for the systems which want to like essentially work at line rate, so saturate 10 gigabit, gigabit links and stuff like that. And well, you have to do something about it. And essentially, you have two insights. One is asynchronous runtime, meaning that I can 
generate a bunch of outstanding messages. And once in a while, I will switch over to another domain. Or at least I will overlap computation and communication. That's kind of important because if you, if you don't even think in terms of like, let's build this crazy infrastructure which I just described, you will end up using the same principles when you build efficient non-decomposed systems. Why? Just because on modern machines, everything is a non-uniform memory. So essentially accessing a remote memory is a latency. And you want to like send a message, do something else, receive it back. You're doing the same stuff when you access your, I don't know, FPGA coprocessors or your GP GPUs. And depending on how smart you are, you have a linear infrastructure or a fatter. And as a GPU, I guess you have fat. But, uh, but that's the major principle. Be asynchronous. And the second is like, uh, well, cross-core transitions are faster on this today, in some cases, not always, than context switches. And that's why it's essentially go from one core to another horizontally. Never exit into the microkernel. Never context switch the page tables. Just do the horizontal in a vacation. And I will just, in a second, I will talk about it. And just use, cas ca use cascaders to send messages. OK. Uh, and now we're kind of low on time, so let's uh, let's 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 just quickly <coughs> skip a couple of slides. Let's get to the core. With the okay, no, let's just keep skipping. In your, this is essentially the main slide. So that when, when you run your decomposed system, each of your domain runs a single thread, which is a dispatch <coughs> loop. So it's, I don't know if you program web browsers, you oh, this is the event event-driven programs. Essentially, you receive messages from other components in your tight loop. You do something, uh, like you reply back. The problem, of course, is that, okay, what happens when you have to call into another subsystem and wait for the reply? Well, it's, 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 it's hard because now you have to choose what to do. And the one option is, like, add more threads. But then, you know, it's kind of you, you context switching the threads and, like, it's hard. But you can, you can do this trick. It's called async. Async is a prime trick in all these parallel languages. Here is an example of a do finish block. But inside <coughs> this block, these functions can execute asynchronously. So essentially, I will start foo. If I block, I will switch to bar, execute bar. And we essentially implement this asynchronous runtime in the kernel. <coughs> Let me explain to you how it works. So like again, we start executing normal native code, C, by the way. So starts with do finish block. Starts executing foo, goes like allocates more stack frames on the st stack, and then does a send. And send blocks because it takes forever, so it makes sense to block at this point. What you can do though is that save the state, so you have a run queue. Those are like kind of lightweight green threads, and you say, I will remember where, where I finished. And later on, when the when the reply to my to my message comes back, I will be re ready to continue. And so you, you also like remember that you don't have to return from foo back to like to the next line. But instead your runtime unrolls the stack, understand that the next line to execute it is, is I mean the line after foo in this example happens to be another asynchronous function, but it might be just regular C code first. And start executing bar. To execute bar you need to allocate a stack because you know like, well, you need stacks to execute functions. And so we do allocate stacks and start rolling in bar. And again, it blocks. We add it to the queue. Sometime later on, the message comes back for the foo. We re remove foo from the queue and finish it. And then, of course, we will finish bar as well later on. I'm not going to show. So this kind of is the core of your event dispatch loop. Again, the high-level principle, if you are an unhappy web browser programming, this is your key. Just go with async if your runtime supports it. Because normally when you send a message, you have to remember where, you, where you've been, what you were doing. And when it comes back, you have to like recover the state. And it's called stack ripping. But with async, essentially your normal code, like while loop, just one word, keyword has changed. But you can invoke this dispatch, message dispatch functions uh, asynchronously, meaning they can block, you can dispatch more of them. And, and they compose. So if, if inside this patch you have another async, you don't even have to think about it. You always think locally. So this 
composability of asynchronous I/O is was a was a kind of a big issue for for a while. But then, especially in native languages, because it's, in languages like Java, you well, you can think of how you want to do that. But I just showed you how to do that in a native in a native C. Uh, and again, just to to to, to add uh, even more flavor, async is a keyword. So to support it, you have to patch the compiler. One more minute, okay. Oh, you don't want to patch the GCC because it moves forward. You're not going to support it. So instead, you choose to implement it as macrosys, which is beautiful because first, I mean, the macrosys, you can change implementation and maybe other compilers will support it as well. But this is how we do that. And actually, we, we take it from Barrelfish, microkernel from Timothy Roscoe, uh, ETH Zurich. But, uh, but the funny part that you can, you, can, you can allocate a new thread, meaning you allocate a stack for it in 24 cycles. And then you context switch between the two within the like with the budget of 80 something cycles, and and then you can do this invocation fast because you can dispatch a bunch of things that cost you nearly nothing, and then underneath there is this uh, cache coherence protocol which looks like that, which kind of sends messages to other cores, and and everything is fine. Okay, now since uh, I ran out of time, <coughs> let's uh, get straight to conclusions somewhere. Where are the conclusions? Okay, we. I, I, I hear this. Ooh, yeah. Okay, let's recap what we were trying to build. We wanted to build this. So essentially, we want to have guarantees about this stack. Stack which runs underneath a mission critical application. Something like a medical device. Let's assume it's an insulin pump which you wear on your body all the time. But you know, if someone exploits the Linux kernel, well, you screw it because then it will shut you with an insulin if you dead. But here, if you decompose and suddenly have and, 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 and verify those subsystems of have, have some like model checking guarantees of static analysis, and this stack is completely isolated from the rest of the, your system, you can boot like normally, you have your GUI stack running, but this mission critical application is there. So it's like one use case scenario for this, for this, uh, for this project. And again, since uh, Harry is looking at me, we will, we will conclude. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, thanks for coming. Uh, we're always looking for students. Uh, there's, we had a large team in Utah. Now I'm here. There are some bits of pieces like Vikram is with us, but uh, and some people in Utah State. But uh, we need more. And this is like all of, all of this is built by students. It's a lot of fun. You will become a, like a hardcore network, or not network OS operating systems person. Google will hire you. They hired Michael. Uh, who else? Uh, this guy, Charles Tate, was the best startup in Salt Lake City. This is Intel. So everyone is happy to join. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, questions? I don't know if we have time. OK, so before, before the question and the answer session, I guess for 200 S students, the check-in word today is Utah. U-T-A-H, capital U, yeah. to honor the presenter. <laughs> All right, so we still have probably five minutes-ish to have some short questions. If you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. Yeah, let's, let's do the question fast. Okay, Alex. Uh, so I'm curious, when we do the, the analysis in the kernel, uh, how much uh, are the modules linked together? Well, the kernel itself. I, I, I mean, the short answer: we we, we just talked, so the, we, we we did all the work manual. And we spent several years building the infrastructure, analysis, and LLVM support. We essentially implemented a couple of months ago. Now we work on it, and we we try to avoid working with entire kernel. So we, if it's a file system, we we just work with the file system subtree. And, uh, but no, there are many issues in our analysis. It's just the best effort service, so no, it might die. I mean, we need someone like Hari who says, well, I have a tool which will like go parallel, runs us crazy fast, and then then, then everything is, is good. Uh, no more questions? Uh, oh, question. So when you build the isolation, how do you make sure the code for the isolation is bug free? Oh, good question. No, we don't know. So okay, the story of this project is when we just started, we were thinking of using the ACL4 microkernel. So ACL4 microkernel was the first fully verified microkernel. 
when we started, the source code for ACL4 was not available. So we essentially, we modeled a bunch of ACL4 interfaces and like ideas. The capabilities come from ACL4, but we couldn't use it. And of course, no, there is no guarantee. There is the only guarantee which proves that you know your code, your, your isolation layer is correct as a full uh, functional correctness of the verification algorithm. However, if you're so clever to ask this question, how do you trust your CPU that the page table switch is correct? <laughs> no, really, like SGX. SGX is a enclave layer on Intel CPUs. It's, it's, it's hard. In terms of lines of code, it might be larger than LCDs. And, and you trust it just because it's, it comes from Intel. And of course, Intel uses a verification tool chain, which we supposedly run. But no, people who find bugs in the CPUs, they are they kind of like become famous. That's why we need guarantees. We don't trust anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but that's why that's why it's a CL4 microkernel is a better, better, better choice than SGX enclaves because wow, you at least can you can peer review what's going on. It's open source now, and you have full proof of functional correctness. I don't think Intel has full proofs. Maybe they're getting there though.